Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. Steve Norris is a Renaissance man, a man of the world. More than 20 years ago, he and I toured Kosovo, when nobody in Britain knew whether a Kosovar was something you should eat, drink, or lick. A Liverpool contemporary of Paul McCartney, he enthralled the Soviet-era crowd with a beautiful piano recital. Another contemporary of his was Edwina Curry. She claimed in her memoirs to have had a tryst with him. Rather ungallantly, Steve said he couldn't remember it. But that was all yesterday. And although he made it into important ministerial positions under Prime Minister John Major's government, he never got as far as his talents should have taken him. Though he was twice the Tory candidate for Mayor of London. And we're always delighted to welcome him on board the Sputnik. Steve, thanks for coming in. It's great it's to see It's been quite a battle to get you here because London, as we record this, is in a state of chaos. The Uber drivers who have been going forth and multiplying have tripled their fares for the day. Uh, the tube workers are on their biggest strike for 10 sure. years, a complete, solid 100% walkout because your mate, the mayor, uh, part-time mayor now, uh, has sought to introduce something world-changing for them. 24-hour uh, tubes yeah. without a whisper of negotiation. It's uh, it, it's a bit of uh, it's a bit of a mess now, London. It, well, that certainly is an unfortunate position to be, and I'm going to be as diplomatic as I can because you know I, Boris has got enough problems, frankly, from what I can tell. But you're right. I mean, the, the, it's a great idea to be running tubes. 24 I agree with hours. that. But you have to negotiate. But you've got to make sure you're taking people with you. And I mean, this is I think you know it's so important in the public sector. And, do you know, I'm going to say something that people might be surprised about, but when I was Minister for Transport, I actually went many times in the cab of a, of a tube train. I don't know a more awful job. And it's because it's unbelievable tedium interrupted by just short periods of immense stress. It's not a nice job. No. You know, I know they get well paid, but, you know, it's not a job I think I would want to do myself. And maybe if people understood that a bit better, there might be a bit more sympathy for the yes, guys themselves. Um, one of Boris's ambitions is driverless uh, trains. Of course, yeah, yeah. we talk now more or less on the anniversary of 7-7, seven, seven, yeah. when if we'd had driverless trains and we'd had no staff on the platforms, the carnage and mm. the mm. Uh, mass murder. Uh, could have been e even worse. But we ought to just distinguish something. Um, we've had driverless trains in London for donkey's years. I mean, the, the Docklands Light Railway has been running for over 20 years driverless. Nobody cares. Of course not. Of course the technology says you don't need a driver, but what you do need is you do need somebody on the train. Just because, you know, these are human beings getting on and off. When you're running 30 trains an hour, that's a train every two minutes, you know, the, the idea of getting people on and off in a civilised way, making sure that nobody's caught with a limb or, you know, a piece of clothing stuck in a door that could really, you know, cause dreadful harm to them, all of that sort of thing really does need human management. Okay. You know, the best difference between London now and the Paris Metro, which we used to look on when I was a minister as, as being, you know, the, 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 the real benchmark, the difference now is that it feels much better to travel on the London Underground precisely because we do have people on the platform you know there are human beings giving you human messages sometimes three of them giving you different messages mm. at the same time mm. but much better that you go on the Paris Metro now there are no people present you see no one it's much more edgy the whole experience particularly for people who aren't used to it is frankly much less pleasant yeah, yeah. so yeah. I, why don't we build on what's good mm. you know and building on what's good means building on the goodwill of the drivers mm. these are not guys they're not wreckers no they're not instinctively wreckers so no. let's hope this is That's the last my, day we have chaos idea. Like Where this. do you stand on that? Uh, I'm a big supporter of the black cabs. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we had their uh, union leader on here just a few weeks ago. Where do you stand on this Uber business, this mm. absolute uh, letting rip of market forces? Yeah. Uh, I, I, threatening... Uh, a part of our national heritage. Uh, you, if, I, mean, I love London's black cabs. You know, as far as I'm concerned, we're the only city, major city in the world where every black cab is wheelchair accessible. We can mm. take disabled people. It's a system where the drivers speak the language of the country and know the city intimately. So if you don't know it, you can show them a piece of paper with an address on, they'll get you there straight away. The meter says you'll get charged a fare that's proper and sensible. Nobody's going to be ripping you off. But I think it's high time the TfL, Transport for London, said, look, do we want to keep the black cab? I think there are so many reasons why we do. And if we do, then what have we got to do to integrate 
technology with a service that's the best in the world. You know, there are all sorts of issues around that because the real issue in terms of Uber is not the meter, it's safety, it's personal safety. Uh, where, is the, where is the photograph that tells me that the person who arrives is actually the person that I thought was going to be arriving? How do I know that that person doesn't have a criminal record, for example, at the and moment? How do you know he's insured? And how do I know he has proper harm and reward insurance? How do I know that his vehicle has a proper MOT? How do I know that, you know, all of those things that I ought to expect and that I know I get with a licensed taxi? How do I know they're all there? Mm. Now, if we can get that right, then I'll be quite straightforward with you, George. I, I believe that in the end, you know, no particular industry is sacred. Nobody has a right to a living. I mean, it's, uh, you know, blacksmiths weren't terribly keen on the pneumatic tire. But TfL needs to do more. That's the point. Yes. They need to take this issue yeah. seriously, and I don't think they are at the moment. Yeah. Totally failing London is what the acronym uh, mm. that springs to mind. Mm. We meet just after the budget. Mm. Uh, George Osborne, whether you like his measures or not, was a kind of political and public relations uh, mm. flurry. Mm. Uh, he certainly established himself mm. as the heir apparent to David Cameron, who after all has told us he's going to go on for a, another four years, no mm. more. Mm. Um, but Boris is in there when he should be in the mayor's office, but he's in there, he's in the cabinet, he's in the parliament and running openly to be the next leader. What's your evaluation of the, the claims? Or is it, is it going to be Boy George or is it going to be Boris? Well, of course, I think actually that Boris is probably banking on the idea that by now we'd be in the middle of an election for a new leader of our party. Mm. And patently we're not. I had uh, David Cameron lost. The Conservatives would have said, here is a man who couldn't actually convincingly beat the least popular prime minister in living memory and then couldn't beat the least apparently competent leader of the opposition in living memory. And that would have been pretty damning indictment. And we Conservatives, as you know, are pretty ruthless when it comes to getting real leaders who fail. It would have been a night of the long knives. No, no you don't even have to be long. Mm. But as it happens, that was not what transpired. David Cameron supervised a clear victory with a majority. And therefore, the man who would have fallen with him now rises with him. And by common consent, what you saw yesterday was a bravura performance. That's the expression I think we see most frequently in the press. And what I thought was interesting about it is that he presented it as a great tax cutting budget. The uh, Office of Budget Responsibility, the independent Office of Budget Responsibility, has very clearly indicated it was actually a tax increasing budget. But it was a bravura performance. Mm -hmm. And if anything is said of Osborne, it is said that he is a man with enormous sort of tactical and strategic ambition. Uh, I don't know whether he'll be the next leader. I think you and I know politics well enough to know that you never predict five years in advance what's going to happen. But I think uh, Boris Johnson will now, if he's got any sense, concentrate as much as he can on the job that he's getting paid for, which is to be Mayor of London, and at least for the moment can park any other ambitions. But how does he afford being both the mayor and being an MP and in the cabinet? I mean, don't, don't the people of London can, can, can they not demand for him to choose one or the other? Yeah, I think they can. I mean, Ken Livingston, of course, was famously an MP when he got elected. and uh, He, he was elected. already an MP, though, yeah, when he, he became a, He was man. already an MP. Yeah. And, and um, so, you know, Boris uh, says, well, I'm not doing anything different from Ken. Mm. But I think there is uh, there's a slight difference. Mm. Uh, my own view is that his very clear priority should be London. As it happens, the seat that he now represents is in London, mm. so he's doubly interested in being there. And I would be disappointed if we see too much of Boris in Parliament. I don't want to see him in Parliament. He's not in the Cabinet, incidentally. Okay. He's invited to okay. what's called the political Cabinet meeting, which mm. is quite separate. It's kind of, you know, where do we, how do we develop the messaging and so on, and mm. fine, I, you know. It's, it's an hour a week or an hour a fortnight. The real issue, I think, is he's got to concentrate now on being mm. mayor for London. That's the job that every Londoner wants him to do. Yeah. Last question, uh, because I know, like me, you uh, have friends across the aisle. That's mm. why we're friends. Yeah. Uh, you're looking at the Labour Party now, mm. choosing its uh, leader from the runners and riders. Who do you think is going to get it and why? I'm afraid that I think... Uh, uh, I think, I think, to be honest, Mrs. Balls is going to get it. I think Yvette Cooper will win, and I'll tell you why. Because I think, at the moment, Labour is not ready to debate the real function of a left-of-centre, socially responsible opposition. 
to a government which, of course, as George Osborne proved yesterday, is all very happy to steal their clothes. It amused me, just uh, if I may say so, that uh, the great... Uh, you know, sort of punchline of his whole budget was to actually increase the minimum wage. You know, you can call it whatever you like. Mm. This was something that conservatives viscerally opposed for years when it was suggested this was intolerable, you know, interference in the free market. And yet, actually, it's the linchpin uh, of, his, of his economic strategy. Um, I, I think the problem that Labour has got was, is that with the exception of Jeremy Corbyn, uh, on the left, and to some degree Liz Kendall, who is saying, look at the man who won you three elections and wonder how he did it. The fact is, if you don't want to go back to Blair, and you maybe accept that Jeremy Corbyn's appeal would not necessarily play universally throughout the country, what are either Andy Burnham or Yvette Cooper offering that isn't really what I think Mrs. Uh, Kendall described as, you know, Miliband light? Yeah. Uh, and I'm afraid at the moment I can't answer that question. So I think they'll go for Yvette Cooper because I think she's less contentious. I think she's playing a cannier game in the election than Andy Burnham. But I'm afraid I don't think that's the long-term future for Labour. I think a thoughtful, serious, left-of-centre, constructive opposition that takes the position that inequality in our society is still uh, a desperate problem and never, nowhere less so than in London. You know, okay. but comes up with solutions to that inequality which don't rely on the idea that you make the poor richer by making the rich poorer because we know that doesn't work. So come up, please, please give me some really creative ways in which we can make a more equal society that doesn't in the process stifle innovation and entrepreneurship. I think that's the challenge for Labour. I don't think any of the four candidates that we've got at the moment are really addressing that. I fear that the least worst option will be Mrs Cooper. Mrs. Balls. Mrs. Balls, indeed. And I think we, we ought to leave it there, don't you? <laughs> Steve Norris, <laughs> I really wish you were still in the front line of politics. Thanks for joining Pleasure. us. Coming up next, in Europe, the kaleidoscope has been shaken. The pieces are all in flux. Where will they land? We'll be talking to the man who knows best, Professor Steve Keen. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back to Sputnik. Greek democracy may have hauled the euro below the plimsoll line and the high priests of neoliberal financial orthodoxy have been putting the boot in. I say financial orthodoxy, although these same high priests think nothing of running off a few hundred billion in quantitative easing of an afternoon. So orthodoxy, but only when it suits them. Where will it all end if Greece is forced out of the euro? Will the bankers and their creditors take a heck of a beating? And if they are allowed to stay, will there be a new wave of anti-austerity politics that sweeps across Spain, Portugal, Italy, and might even reach here? Nobody knows better what's likely to happen next than the high priest of unorthodoxy, Professor Steve Keen. He joins us now, Professor. This is a momentous weekend. Mm -hmm. As far as you can, what do you predict for the end of it? I'm reading, you've got to read the entrails and the tea leaves to work out what's happening with the way the European Union's behaving over this, but the noises they've been making this week seem like there's certainly a substantial group of them that want to drive Greece out. And Why? I, it really comes down to this worldview they have, which, which, which is called auto-liberalism, which is like a, a, a weird combination of an Austrian attitude about the need for free markets everywhere and keep the government out of it, with a Germanic touch that says, we need, the, uh, we need the law there to make sure that these things are done properly. So you get this incredible focus upon the legal framework of economics, where it's a legal framework for complete free enterprise. But an essential part of what they believe is when you sign a contract, you must deliver. If that contract's involved giving away a pound of flesh, you've got to give away the pound of flesh. And the contract they think they signed was austerity in return for, of course you know it's supposed to deliver, economic recovery. Mm. And my argument is, well, that ain't what you delivered, guys. You delivered economic depression. Yes. But um, they're just simply seeing it from their point of view. You signed on for this contract and they were going to beat uh, Syriza down until they became basically the party they replaced. And isn't, think, isn't, you know, isn't that a triumph of accountancy over economics? If only it was a triumph of accountancy, because one little point I try to make is this violates accountancy. Mm. See, if you think about it, if I, if I take 100 bucks out of your pocket, you go down 100, I go up 100. Now, I can't say to you, why don't you do the same thing, because I've just done it to you in reverse. We're on a seesaw. And it's that seesaw nature of financial transactions, which is why when Germany says to Greece, why can't you be like us? 
The answer is because you're like you. <laughs> you know, yeah. if you get, if there's a trade deficit between, if, if Greece has a trade deficit with Germany, then Germany's got an identical trade surplus, okay? And what's going on here is they're telling the Greeks, you've got to grow while the government's taking money out of your economy, yeah. okay? Yeah. And then at the same time, the public sector, the private sector is taking money out of the economy by either going bankrupt or by paying back their debts or taking it out of the country as well. So you've got two sources that are taking money out of the economy. And the only way left to grow is by the, by the foreign sector, by people coming in and buying Greek goods or Greek tourism. And the difference between those two is gigantic. Mm -hmm. About a 1% or 2% of GDP now after the huge depression in wages in Greece uh, until the latest, you know, the, the impact of the capital control sit in. That was bringing some money, but they were trying to take 3% of GDP out of, it, out of the country via... The, the government running a trade, uh, running a, a budget surplus, which means, of course, to run a budget surplus, you've got to take money out of the private sector. And the, the rate of decline of public, private debt was about 10% of GDP. So there's just, what do you mean you've got a shrinking supply of money unless they grow faster? And it simply can't happen. Yeah. So if accountancy ruled, we wouldn't be having this conversation. It's, it's, it's legality where they've got a distorted vision of what is legal. And this is signed on a contract that means you've got to do what we told you to do. We haven't delivered, but that's your problem. But if, as Gayatri pointed out in the introduction, the, if, uh, if, if uh, they come out of the euro, if they don't pay the debt, mm. it's the banks of Germany and other countries like them that are going to take a very cold bath. In the case of Germany, I think more than 40 billion. Yeah, and there's a huge... I mean, people... <laughs> Some people who follow this know that about 90% or 90, up to 93% of the money that is so-called going to bail out Greece is actually so they can pay their debts back yeah. to both to their creditors, which are actually the Troika, plus German and French banks on yeah. a large scale. Yeah. So they only see about, like, oh, they might be talking about giving them $7 billion. Well, they don't even see $700 million of that as any money actually going into the economy itself. So if this gets shut down, if, 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 they, if they get kicked out, if they default, and they should, if they are kicked out, they should default on the works. Oh, definitely. Uh, it, 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 they should follow Argentina's uh, yeah. move. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if, as you predict, and I think you're right, they are being pushed out of the euro, though the legality of that even is questionable, mm. they should definitely then create their own currency, mm. default on all the debts, mm. uh, turn to Russia and other BRICS countries for mm. such help as can be uh, afforded, and, uh, and hope that being out of the euro actually it begins to generate some growth. There will be. The trouble is, and this is the reason they haven't done it so far, is they, they know they're too small an economy. They know they're too fragile, and they know that they, have, they're just, they don't get the tax off the rich. And you also have the, re, re, the reality that the, the Greek state became a patronage state for a long time. So apparently under the previous Conservative Prime Minister, or whatever, uh, 300,000 new jobs were created in the public service which was all a case of basically feather bedding and, you know, mm. buying patronage by providing employment to particular political mm. groups. So that side of things needs drastic reform. And th that's what Syriza is aware of. They know they've got to get that stuff straightened out. They want to do it. Of course, they spent the last six months in, a, a, you know, crisis du jour caused by the European Union, dribbling out the money each time, trying to push them further and further past the, mm. the red lines they drew in the sand. They've got right back to their very last red line. Surely the success of Iceland should be a model we should strive for. How realistic is it for a country like Greece, who is set in the Eurozone, to succeed in that model too? Um, Iceland has one enormous advantage over Greece, and that is it's got its energy exports. It's also a tiny country, 300,000 people. A boost to tourism, the energy exports, and they're reasonably OK. Greece has the problem that it's got a, a very you know, distorted industrial sector. It's, it doesn't have anything like the, the depth, for example, that Ireland has, where Ireland managed to benefit when they were put through the austerity ringer, by, by I might add, one quarter the degree of austerity that was imposed on Greece. Greece. Yeah. Uh, that, that was, what that meant was their costs dropped sufficiently for the multinationals that produce there to increase the flow through of funds through the Irish economy and you know, the, the gross you know, GDP went up quite significantly courtesy of those effects which Greece can't take advantage of mm. nor the ones in Iceland so if it wasn't for that um, Syriza would have pulled out already mm. no two ways about it if they weren't if they had you know even like twice the scale economy they have they'd be big enough to say right we'll take the 
or take the, roughy, the rocky road. So they're afraid of the transition and they're afraid of just how viable are they going to be once they're back on a floating exchange rate again. But I don't think they're going to have a choice. No, I, I think they're really much way. pushing them out. I know you, you're uh, an economist and a brilliant one rather than a politician, but how do you evaluate how the Syriza leaders have played their hand uh, in the crisis well, to date? Well, Giannis, Giannis probably won't mind me saying this now. Uh, he wrote to me once that they're trying, they were, basically we're, we're, we're being subjected to a putsch. Okay. And he said, basically, the attitude of the European Union was they didn't want Syriza to win, so let's get rid of them. Yeah. There, was, there was a political campaign right from the outset to break their backs and to either force them to become like the party they replaced or to drive them out of office. Yeah. Okay. And in that sense, the referendum uh, was quite a surprise move. They weren't expecting it. And the they were a master stroke, really. Yeah, yeah. And now, of course... They, they're treating as though it didn't happen. Mm. Oh, yes. And it's, yeah. it's, it's the anti-democratic... We respect yeah. the result, but pretend it didn't happen. Yeah. That's exactly. the attitude. Though, yeah, yeah, you did well. Pity, a pity, it's a pity you voted the wrong way. Yeah. But apart from that, congratulations on winning. Now let's go back and do exactly what we were doing last week. Yeah. So the Syriza government looks fairly solid now. I mean, last week at this time, mm. frankly, it wouldn't have been a surprise if they'd been out by Sunday night. Yeah. But now they look uh, strong. They look strong. I just and by the, um, the, mm. the conservative media as well. They had really harsh they media. They very shockingly them. biased uh, Greek private sector media, yeah. and even the state sector didn't uh, didn't actually do their duty. And there's a lot of uh, backlash now in Greece about that. Mm. Uh, but they do look uh, fairly solid. Can they survive? even being pushed out of the euro? They can survive being pushed out of the euro. I mean, th th there's a sense of one thing you can pick up from the Greek uh, reaction to that election was that there's a sense of pride come back because being put through an experience like they've been through, I mean, people talk about they, they, they're responsible for the situation, they should, they should pay the price. I've heard this from some of my mm -hmm. conservative friends mm -hmm. recently. Mm -hmm. They don't realise just how long the punishment has been, just how severe, and just how demoralising, giving people no sense of a future. To why the suicide rates, you know, increased by a factor of five or six in Greece since this whole thing began. And also, today's Greeks are not the people who did yeah, this. They're not the ones who are responsible. It, it, it was the old right-wing yeah. oligarchy in Greece yeah. that did this. Yeah. When most of today's Greeks weren't even born. Not quite that bad, <laughs> but nonetheless, the people in I'm power... I'm always exaggerating. <laughs> The people, the people in power uh, want, to, want to drive the oligarchy out. If they were given even six months space by the European Union, they would have addressed the tax loopholes. They would have started to address the feather bedding and the public service. They would have changed the pension age, because that's ridiculous for the public servants, but they would not have reduced the pension level itself. And this is what people don't realise. The, the downturn in, in Greece has been as bad as the Great Depression or worse. It's also matched the conditions of the Great Depression. There are unemployment benefits for less than 10% of those who lose their job. So 90% of those, 25% of the population that's out of a job don't have any income. What are they relying upon? The pensions being paid by their to their parents. And they're talking about cutting the pensions back. You're not affecting one old person. You're affecting their and their descendants because half the young people are out of a job. One quarter of those between 15 and 64 are also out of a job. It, it's forcing poverty on the country. And you're never going to get any capacity to reform the tax system or anything else while you're simply trying to avoid running out of money virtually mm. on a daily mm -hmm. basis. Well, we'll see how it works out this weekend. Mm. You might have to come back next week and... Uh... Uh, evaluate where we then are. Professor Steve Keen, thanks as always. Welcome. And now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Gayatri? Well, I've asked, uh, what about the Tory leadership, Boy George or Boris, with this picture of them both in China last year? And Chris Day answers, I see Gideon's glass is half full. I've seen more sincerity in the London Zoo Reptile House. Ah, Gideon is, of course, George Osborne's proper name. You see why I changed it. <laughs> OK, and about um, Greece, Grexit, Brexit, what will take it to break it? David Sugar answers, EU as an institution only serves oligarchs, not the peoples of Europe. I don't agree with that. Uh, there's a lot wrong with the EU, but uh, none of it would be made better if the EU were to disappear. The euro, though, is a different question. And that's all that we've got for this week. 
Which, alas, means that's the end of the show. But you can stay in touch with us on Twitter at RT underscore Sputnik and on Facebook, Sputnik on Russia Today. It's goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous.